Steve Jobs vs. Microsoft, Monkey Nuts, and a giant green cyborg who gave birth to the console shooter as we know it. That's right, Space Marines. I'm back, and we're talking about Halo. Combat Evolved. Out of all the launch titles in modern gaming history, none can top the show-stopping impact of the first Halo. Halo Combat Evolved didn't just help launch the Xbox, it kicked off a franchise that continues to give gamers the fanny flutters two decades later. Halo is forever embedded into the DNA of Microsoft and the brains of every gamer so deeply, it literally altered the meaning of the word Halo from the thing why Jesus wears on his head in church paintings to this. But how Halo Combat Evolved fought its way to the top of the mountain is anything but a tale of supernatural purity. It's filled with obsession, innovation, and desperation. This is the secret-ish history of Halo Combat Evolved. You're in for a wild ride. In 1997, just as James Cameron's Titanic was sweeping theaters and showing us once again, car sex is hot, a small game company based in the south side of Chicago was celebrating. Bungie had just released Myth the Fallen Lords, an RTS with a taste for pixelated blood, and it was a smash hit. The team of 50 or so young developers immediately started work on Myth 2, because why not? We all like money, but three members of the Bungie group peeled off to work on a different real-time strategy game, this one with a sci-fi setting. This renegade project was led by Jason Jones, co-founder of Bungie and the creative heartbeat behind pretty much every game they'd ever put out. This new title would feature actual 3D terrain, actual physics, and vehicles. This project was called Monkey Nuts. The name Monkey Nuts was quickly changed to Blam, because according to Marty O'Donnell, Jones didn't want to tell his mother he was working on a project called Monkey Nuts. But I'm gonna continue to use the name Monkey Nuts out of respect for history, and because it's funny. Monkey Nuts. As the futuristic RTS began to take shape, one element stood out. Taking your tiny space marines and putting them into a Hummer-like vehicle and driving them into battle. So before Master Chief, before the Slayer, before the haunting theme song, there was the Warthog. This was the flashpoint that set the team on a different path. The vehicle was fun to watch, but it would be even more fun to actually drive the thing. So the team created a build where players could zoom in and drive the Warthog directly. Soon the camera stayed zoomed in and all the strategy elements fell away. Monkey Nuts was now a full-fledged third-person combat shooter. The team grew, artists expanded the alien races, a drivable boat, and a unit called the Cyborg, an exciting addition to the human faction. There was no story, it was just a sandbox of features, but only one thing mattered. It was fun to play. E3 1999. Bungie brings Monkey Nuts to the floor of the expo in an exclusive behind-closed-door presentation. Journalists and VIPs are forced to sign a very scary NDA before they get a taste of Bungie's third-person shooter. The media buzz was intense, and no one in the public had seen even a single image from Bungie's next great big thing. The next step was to officially reveal Monkey Nuts to the world, preferably on the biggest stage possible. Peter Tomty's job was to create new business opportunities for Bungie, and he knew this game was worth swinging for the fences. So he called his old boss, Steve Jobs. The team was given a meeting to present the demo. It would be to Steve Jobs himself. The only people there were Jason Jones and a single support tech to present the demo to him. Their mission, to get Jobs to give them a spot on stage at Macworld, which was only a few weeks away. Steve Jobs walked in, literally in the middle of eating a fudge soup. Jason played the demo, selling hard how this game did things no other game in the market was doing, like moving from interiors to exteriors. Jobs stopped the demo. He pointed out that Pixar could easily render stuff more impressive than what Jones was showing off. Jones asked if they could do it in real time. Jobs paused for a long while, then said, You're in. Macworld would be the launch pad for Bungie's new title, which, at this juncture, didn't have a title. An agency had come up with hundreds of possible titles and finally landed on Covenant. They had created logo treatments and everything when one of the artists, Paul Russell said, and I quote, Covenant? That name is stupid. He wasn't the only one who felt that way. Most people internally hated the title, 
Even Alex Seropian, the founder of Bungie, hated it. Paul wrote out a number of alternate titles, one of which was Halo. It stuck. But this wouldn't be the last fight over what to call the game with the big green cyborg. The team crunched as they prepared the demo for Macworld. The gameplay footage would be ready, but just barely. And since everything had to run off a of Mac live during the Macworld presentation, the team didn't have time to get the audio working. The whole project had been developed on PCs until just a few weeks earlier. The demo needed a music track or there would be no audio at all. Similar to not having a title, the game didn't have a music track. It was Thursday. This demo had to be on a plane by Tuesday. Marty O'Donnell, the audio lead and composer for Bungie, went to work. He had a weekend to write the piece, a day to record it, hours to mix it, and he f***ing nailed it. The theme was haunting, epic, and completely different from anything else in the shooter genre. In July of 1999, Steve Jobs personally presented Halo to the world. This presentation blew the bucket hats off its 90s audience members, and Halo quickly became one of the most highly anticipated games of the year. Jobs proudly announced the new game would release on Mac and PC the following year. It did neither, because Bungie was going broke. Industry's worst kept secret was that Microsoft was developing a home game console. Now this is usually a terrible idea because designing, manufacturing, and launching a new piece of hardware is extremely difficult. But trying to get PlayStation, Nintendo, and Dreamcast owners to actually buy it? Well, that's next to impossible. Members of Bungie and Rockstar Games were invited to see Microsoft's Direct Xbox console. It was powerful and would be a much more stable platform for gaming than a traditional PC. Bungie thought Halo could be a good fit for the new console. And did I mention? Bungie was broke. Peter Tomty, the same guy who called Steve Jobs to get Halo in Apple's good graces, now called their biggest competitor and told the head of Microsoft Game Studios the truth. Bungie was out of money. They needed to be acquired or the company would go under before they could release another game. And this was all because of Myth 2. Remember Myth 2? That surefire hit that most of Bungie was working on when Jason and two other developers were paving the road to Halo? Before the team had even shown Halo to those first journalists at E3 1999, they shipped Myth 2. That holiday season of 1998, hundreds of thousands of copies were on their way to retailers around the world when a bug was discovered. If the game was installed and uninstalled in a particular way, it would erase other data off the user's computer hard drive. Bungie could have let the copy sell and quietly refunded money to anyone who had their computer wiped by a buggy install, but they didn't. The company made the tough decision to recall every copy of Myth 2 and reissue a fixed version. 200,000 copies were scrapped, more than half the number of discs Myth Fallen Lords had sold in its entire run. The debacle cost the company $800,000 before they ever sold a single copy of Myth 2. This financial hit had permanently crippled Bungie. While the world was celebrating Halo as one of the most anticipated games of all time, the financial troubles festered, grew worse and worse until it was clear the company would not survive. They had to sell or Halo would die in the womb. Microsoft quietly negotiated a deal with the founders of Bungie, and now the folks that had insisted Jennifer Aniston and Matthew Perry teach people how to operate Windows 95 owned everything Bungie had worked for. This was a heartbreaking development in a couple of key ways. Bungie, from the beginning, was a fiercely independent group of talent, sometimes foolishly so. The early team members admit that experience was ridiculed. The team would learn how to do things their own way. They were young, smart, hungry, arrogant. Their motto in those early days was to reinvent fire every week. The team brimmed with talent and seemed to not care about limits. In the ramp up to the release of Myth the Fallen Lords, people stayed at the office every waking hour, sometimes even more than that. They worked on the clock, not seeing their families or even the sun for days at a time. One artist nearing the end of his work visa opted to move out of his apartment, living at the office in the final weeks before the game shipped. At the center of this was Jason Jones, a brilliant and driven designer and programmer. He ate, breathed, and dreamed games. It was the only thing he'd ever wanted to do with his life since fifth grade when he'd raised the other four computer geeks in his class for the three available PCs in his school. 
Jones dropped out of college to co-found Bungie. Making games was his life's work, and he'd found people who were just as passionate and obsessed as he was. Defiance of convention and a sense of creative freedom had defined Bungie up to this point, and they'd created incredible games. And now, they would have a higher authority they would need to answer to. Once they signed the deal, Microsoft could call the shots. The exact same thing happened the previous year to another Chicago-based developer, Fossa, the creators behind the MechWarrior series, and it destroyed the company. The game developer community in Chicago was tiny. Most game companies at the time were based in California or Texas, so many of the guys at Bungie knew people at Fossa. After Fossa's move, they had watched the MechWarrior IP stumble, teams split up, and key personnel fired. The development studio as it had existed collapsed under the Microsoft umbrella, and Bungie was about to walk the exact same road. The first part of that journey was to relocate the entire team to Seattle to work directly with the Xbox division. This team of independent creators was suddenly working for a giant corporation that demanded they move across the country. I can relate. When Bungie arrived to continue their work on one of the Microsoft campuses in Redmond, they were greeted with a comically corporate setting. A sea of cubicles. Gone was the pizza box, frat house, persistent locker smell, sleep on the pool table insanity of their Windy City office. Like it was literally a frat house. There are only two women that are credited in the first Halo game. One is a cinematic artist, and one is a game manual print artist. Anyway, to punctuate the fact that Bungie was now in corpo hell, their cube mates were the Encarta Encyclopedia group. It was like a Dilbert cartoon, but without the QAnon subtext. What came next was a clash of cultures piled on top of a mad dash to finish a game that did things no one had ever done before. Bungie started building walls within their cubicle fortress. It got to the point where a generic Microsoft keycard wouldn't get you access to the Bungie area at all. It was a devs only zone. They would even get corporate interlopers' cars towed out of the parking lot when they had had enough snooping. In the background of all this drama was the job they were there to do to create a launch title for the Xbox console release. Microsoft Game Studios had 30 or 40 irons in the fire for Xbox. They were less than a year from the big hardware release. Panic was high and money was no object. They had three different games in development based on Spielberg's movie AI. Those all flamed out. There was something called Azeric, which everyone knew was a piece of shit. Of course, there was Munch's Odyssey. And there was Halo a game being developed by a bunch of PC guys who had never touched a console before, and the game was still a third-person shooter. Way back in the pre-Myth days, Jason Jones had pushed the company away from first-person shooters because he felt like what they were doing was too close to what id Software was building with Quake. But as Halo became less focused on group combat and more zeroed in on the cyborg, it needed a new perspective. Jason ultimately pushed to go from third-person to first-person. This meant a near total reset on a ton of work and exposed a massive problem. FPSs on console sucked. But what about GoldenEye, you say? GoldenEye was the Hallmark console shooter. GoldenEye was incredible. That's like me saying that Red Dawn was a fantastic movie. No, it's not. It's just the nostalgia and the pavement talking. FPS console games in the late 90s ranged from fine, to garbage, to non-existent. If Halo was going to aim higher than that, it would require a fundamental leap in the control design. They did that, and you probably guessed they succeeded because we're doing a video about it. Yes, Halo reinvented how shooters should play on a console, and it's thanks almost entirely to one man. Gamers owe a lot to the team behind Halo, but Jamie Greisimer just might be the most influential programmer you've never heard of. He is directly responsible for mapping character movement and camera to the two independent thumbsticks. This seems obvious now, but it had never been done on a console before. Well, that's not exactly true. It had been done a year earlier in the PlayStation Alien Resurrection game. So, unless that game comes knocking like some long-lost love child, Halo did it first. It thinks you're its mother. <laughs> And because the controller is much less precise than the keyboard and mouse, as every esports athlete can attest, huge amounts of code went into the game intuiting what the player was trying to do, not what they're actually doing with their thumbs. 
Halo would be constantly anticipating what was going on in the player's brain without them ever knowing it. And this was just one innovation. Halo introduced tons of new ideas into the gameplay. The dual weapon inventory, the way grenades worked, even the way vehicles drove. The very thing that had sparked the idea for Halo in the first place. I actually got to play Halo before it launched back in the spring of 2001. And believe it or not, myself and many other folks in the room were truly baffled by the Warthog controls. I was used to the complicated driving dynamics of other games at the time, and controlling a massive combat hummer with just one joystick made absolutely no sense to me. But Bungie's instincts were spot on. In many ways, Halo Combat Evolved invented a musical scale that so many other games compose with. Look at almost any game on the market today and you'll find at least one Halo innovation in it. And there's a lot of them. Maestro? Mass Effect Battlefield, Outer Worlds, Left 4 Dead, Bioshock, Infinite Fear, Borderlands, CF2, Titanfall, Deus Ex, and Metro Sex, it is too. There's Destiny, Valorant, Perfect Dark Zero, Crisis in Space, and Far Cry, Cyberpunk, Fall 3, lots of Tom Clancy's, Republic Commando, and Killzone, and Alan Wick, Overwatch, Dishonored, Apex, and Gears of War, and of course, Call of Duty. Gameplay is key, but without characters and story, games are more like toys than the rich experiences we all love. And Halo had neither. The cyborg, as the playable character was known, could now move and shoot, but it was an empty vessel. They had a design created by Marcus Leto and refined by artist Shai Kai Wong, and they wanted his name to be John. Wow, John, super original, guys. The idea came up to have the cyborg called by his rank. They wanted to call him Commander, but one of the artists was a stickler for military history. In the Navy, commanders are not sent into combat. The team looked up the highest rank in the Navy considered expendable. That rank, an E-9 Master Chief Petty Officer. Duh, everyone knows that. They shortened the title to just Master Chief, and finally, all the pieces were in place. The only thing left was to finish the damn thing. Unfortunately, there was not enough time to finish the damn thing. That meant cuts. Too many missions to finish in time? Cut 10 or 20 of them, including the one where you learned the Halo is called Halo. They added this cutscene instead. I overheard the guards talking about this ring world. They call it Halo. The blue arrows on the ground were put there by a game tester because they kept getting lost, and they just kind of stayed. The team at one point faced having to cut either the shotgun or the sniper rifle. The team decided to cut the shotgun. It was later saved by a small group deciding on their own to work extra shifts. Oh, and they had already cut multiplayer entirely. That's right, the task of completing Halo required all the resources being directed to the core single player game. So they took everybody off multiplayer when they moved to Seattle. But Jason Jones had attached a lifeline. He tapped just two developers fresh off the Oni project and said, if Halo was going to have multiplayer, period, it's up to the two of you. We'll circle back to that. The crunch was intense. The music and sound effects for all 33 cutscenes had to be completed in three days. The audio and sound designer on the first day had already completed 11 cutscenes. That day was September 10th, 2001. And the next day, was 9-11. The pressure was such a fever pitch that everyone still went into the office because it felt like they couldn't lose a day of work for any reason. Cooler heads prevailed and sent everyone home for the day, but the pressure to hit the deadline was next level. A few weeks later, the deadline arrived. The campaign, what was left of it after a dozen missions were cut away, was finished. Was multiplayer in or out? Miraculously, as the main game had been getting forged by the larger team, Hardy LaBelle and Michael Evans, those two Oni designers, had kept hammering away and created a multiplayer feature that actually worked. They didn't have time to make it work as an online mode, but the local gameplay was incredibly fun. It was added to the final build, carried on the back of just two developers. As the game code was getting locked, there was time for one final tweak. Jason Jones made a small change to the final build. He increased the power on the pistol in multiplayer. The weapon was too weak, no one used it, so he put his thumb on the scale. Yes, he admitted it. The three-shot kill pistol was his doing. He takes all the credit and all the blame. Everything was looking great until they got one final note. The title. 
Sometimes cases are never closed. Microsoft and the high-powered marketing firm they hired were still worried no one would know what a halo was because the title didn't scream, shooty shooty grenade explosion. The compromise was adding a subtitle, Combat Evolved, which according to Greesimer, was the stupidest thing ever. It's not even good grammar. Halo had Combat Evolved in its official title, which really didn't mean anything, but it was better than calling it Monkey Nuts. I guess. The team loved the game. They had uprooted their lives for it. They had lost months of sleep over it. Some of them still hadn't even unpacked their boxes since the move to Seattle. There just wasn't enough time. But now, the job was finished. The game shipped, and it sold fine. Just fine. Microsoft's console was a giant ugly thing trying to gain acceptance in a very tough market with a very tough crowd. Halo wasn't initially a bestseller, but the sales didn't drop off. It kept selling and selling. Month after month, copies steadily walked off the shelves. For every 10 gamers who bought an Xbox, five of them also bought Halo. And people fell in love with Master Chief, Cortana, and that world. And in apartments, bedrooms, and dorm rooms across the country, gamers were lugging their Xboxes to each other's houses to play the best damn FPS multiplayer that had ever existed on a console. Soon, Master Chief was the face of Xbox, the way Mario was the face of Nintendo, or Crash was the face of PlayStation. Without Halo, the Xbox project very likely would have been quietly abandoned by Microsoft. It's happened plenty of times before with plenty of other failed game consoles. The term Halo Killer became a thing other developers strived for. Halo earned a unique place in gaming history and changed the entire industry by showing how you can bring a shooter gameplay experience to a console that's just as compelling as on a PC, and that games can play with emotions that are more than just heavy metal, action, and blood. Bungie had permanently increased the standard by which all shooters are judged, but in many ways, Halo is about winning the battle but losing the war. Halo is still one of the most hotly anticipated franchises. Halo Infinite is coming out this December, and I'm sure Master Chief's story will continue for years to come. But Bungie is no longer a part of it. That independent streak that got cars towed and led people to care so passionately that they still went to work when people weren't sure if the world was actually ending is ultimately part of the reason why Bungie and Microsoft had such a spectacular divorce. The Bungie team went on to create Halo 2, 3, ODST, and finally Halo Reach a game about the last stand of the Spartans where they all die in a massacre and Master Chief is left to carry on the fight alone. Which, you could say, is poetic. Hey, uh, let us know if you want us to make one of these videos about Halo 2 because guess what? That development process was a tornado hellfire. Okay, you've heard me warble on about why I like Halo combat subtitles so much. So how about you now jump into the comments below and let G4TV rest of the internet know what your favorite moments from the game are. If you haven't already, melee that shiny subscribe button below because we're always like uploading really good content, including a video called What the Hell Happened to Halo Infinite, as well as my thoughts on the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, a game you should definitely be picking up. Because guess what, internet? I think we're just getting started.